Hi, I'm Michael B. Frisch, a psychology professor from Baylor University. With me today is Dr. Richard J. Estes. This oral history project is made possible through the generous support of the International Society for Quality of Life Studies and the Gallup Institute for Global Well-Being. Baylor University is also a proud sponsor. Dr. Richard J. Estes is a professor of social work at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the past president of the International Society for Quality of Life Studies. He's a recipient of many awards and grants for his research in international social work and comparative social development throughout the world. He's the author of 15 books and numerous articles and chapters in the top journals and books of his field. Dr. Estes, can you tell me where you grew up? I did. I grew up in Philadelphia in a family of six children. My father uh, was a fireman. My mother was uh, a homemaker. And uh, what kind of experiences you think led you to pursue uh, advanced education? Uh, it was really quite a struggle for me to make that decision because the culture in which I grew up did not value particularly advanced education. The idea was that one would acquire the basic education and then move into the workforce and contribute back to the family financially in whatever way was possible. And uh, I was insistent from very early in my life that I wanted to be an academic to the point that even as a child they would call me Professor Estes uh, wow. among my peers, which amazing. is really quite, quite an amazing situation. So how old were you at this time when you first had this idea of being a, an academic as I'd a college level? nine really? or ten. Hmm. Right, because I read my way through our neighborhood library, certainly mm -hmm. by the age of 12. Wow. I'd gone through uh, the entire library. Mm -hmm. So it was a very conscious decision on my part to pursue advanced education of a professional nature and to deal with uh, what I felt to be the problems that I experienced as a child and the others in my community experienced that were of a more structural nature. Mm -hmm. Well. Um was there anyone in your life who supported this, uh, this extra reading and the, and the idea of education? I would say it was more genetic. Uh, okay. There was no librarian or teacher not or family all. member? No. In your extended family? Not at all. I just uh -huh. had this enormous intellectual curiosity uh, about mm. the world and the situation of the world and the peoples of the world mm. that really uh, provided the motivation for me. But there was not in the early years of my life, a mentor that gave uh, direction to, uh, mm -hmm. to how it is that I would subsequently mm -hmm. develop. That so, didn't happen until later in life. Mm -hmm. So um, at what age did you discover the library or start going? I would say around age six, mm -hmm. uh, when the librarian kept telling me I had exceeded the number of books that I could check out, <laughs> then I <laughs> simply decided I would check into the library. Uh -huh. and uh, read as much as possible uh, from that point. Could you forward. walk to the library? Was the I neighborhood safe? Yes, and your there parents were several were okay? libraries, yes. Uh -huh. And the neighborhood was safe for me to do that, and uh, I did that, uh, I'd say, for a good number of years. And then when I entered uh, secondary education, of course, I had access to many other resources. Mm -hmm. So it was really a very, very much an internal driven um, compassion on my part to understand the larger social systems within which mm -hmm. uh, all of us function. How interesting. Did you have any other hobbies or interests as a kid? Uh, music. Uh -huh. Can and you I tell was, me about that? Yes, I just loved classical music. Um, and I think it was classical music that led me into my undergraduate majors of English literature and philosophy, mm. uh, which reinforced even more deeply the kind of worldview that I had about people and the, uh, the problems and the special situations that people in different societies experienced. And what were the problems you saw in your neighborhood growing up? You said Enormous poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in an area of Philadelphia which was mostly uh, white, mostly Catholic, with very large families and very poor people. What neighborhood is this? Uh, Southwest Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Uh, my father was a city fireman who subsequently died from uh, 
his rescuing of people within uh, bur burning buildings from the smoke inhalation associated with that. How old were you when he died? He was, I, I was uh, 18, he uh -huh. was 46 at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was just at the point that I was making the transition out of home mm -hmm. into uh, university life. But um, it was something that I very much admired him for because of uh, what it is that he represented. Mm -hmm. But the people in the community were basically very poor and would, uh, there would be constant campaigns to give canned goods and clothing and whatever to families that had fewer resources than others in the community. And who'd run those campaigns? Usually through the, the church. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of the, uh, the local parochial churches would uh, run those campaigns and identify families in special need and then make uh, those resources available. Was your family involved with the church uh, in any way? Or? I was. I was mm -hmm. brought up Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. but I left uh, Catholicism uh, very early in my career, probably uh, about the age of 17 or 18, and became more of a Unitarian uh, mm -hmm. following that. But uh, did you go to parochial schools at I all? I did. Undergraduate at the uh, elementary and secondary, and even at the post-secondary level, all of my uh, education was really through Catholic uh, schools. Did you find any uh, interest or compassion on their part for the poor? Uh, Very much from so. Your teachers? The, uh, the teachers, the particular order of uh, teachers that I had at the secondary and post-secondary level were all committed to service to people in urban poor communities. What so, order is this? Uh, they were called the, uh, they were brothers, Christian brothers. Mm -hmm. Then they had the initials FSC after the name, so mm -hmm. we called them food, shelter, and clothing, <laughs> <laughs> which so, made total sense in terms huh. of uh, what they were concerned with. But they were also hard-nosed men who really knew how to impose discipline and give direction to, uh, to people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, did any of them influence your interests in uh, looking not at an, poverty? Or? Not, an individual, uh -huh. not an individual person. I think... I came to the issue of poverty and social and economic disparity, even political disparity, very much on my own through, mm -hmm. uh, through my studies. And uh, I was able to attract a significant number of uh, my own peers to a uh, concern for this, and we organized various uh, groups that would uh, assist those who were considerably poorer than what we experienced. We considered ourselves poor, but we were by far less poor than many other people in mm -hmm. the uh, community. Was there any, growing up, was there any uh, uh, particular people or examples of poverty, say families near you, or that particularly touched you or moved you or upset you? Well, I would say uh, there, there was one young man who was about the same age who very brutally killed his parents and grandparents. What was his first name? Home. His name is John. Uh -huh. And uh, I realized the tremendous sense of deprivation, emotional deprivation that he experienced. And that resulted in this kind of family uh, homicide. And uh, he also killed himself in the, the process. But this was back in the early 1960s, late 1950s when it mm -hmm. took place. And what kind of deprivation you think John experienced? I think um, much of it had to have been emotional, but I think a lot of it had to be anger over the situation in which he found himself. That uh, he was bright and he was uh, a, a very smart looking young man, but uh, just couldn't get out of the situation in which he was in. He just felt trapped by the structure in which he was, into which he was born. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I understood that. And he lived only four or five houses down from where I lived. So I, I got to know him and his family quite well. Um, in some of my experience working with people on probation and sex offenders, I've noticed that uh, uh, so many parents have to work so much that there are many times that kids won't really see the parents very often. Was that a situation you that observed? That was not the or? situation for him. Mm -hmm. That is for John in particular. Mm -hmm. His mother was a stay-at-home mm -hmm. homemaker. Uh, his father was sort of in and out of the situation. And he did have a relationship with his grandparents also, mm -hmm. who lived not so uh, far away. Mm -hmm. 
so that uh, there was some proximity mm -hmm. to them as well, emotional proximity to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically what you saw growing up was uh, like one big rummage sale, bake sale kind of thing for, Pretty much. to help support people. Pretty much. Uh -huh. And uh, these Christian brothers had some commitment to social justice or the no poor? No question about it. That was their primary commitment, was to working with uh, children in inner cities in uh, difficult situations and providing them with a uh, basic education so that they can move into other avenues of activity that would be more productive for them. So they're being, they're being in Southeast Philly would say that they, that was like a mission for them in a sense. That or was their mission. Probably not the way. most popular area to teach not among other all. teachers. Not uh -huh. at all, no. And they weren't priests, they were brothers. Uh -huh. So they already had accepted a different role for themselves within the Catholic uh, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I think one of the things that they introduced, which was very important, was uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. That uh, people needed to be very disciplined, very cautious about the kinds of decisions that they, they would make. And of course, to be respectful of other people. Mm -hmm. were, were they or you uh, involved in any kind of uh, social justice or anti-poverty activities as, as a child yes, growing up? Yes, growing up in those early years, this is, uh, I'm now 66, so I grew up in the era of John F. Kennedy and uh, the uh, free speech movement in uh, California, as well as the uh, liberation movement among African Americans, and of course all the tragedies associated with the assassinations and killings mm -hmm. of, uh, of the leaders mm -hmm. of those movements. Mm -hmm. So I was very much uh, involved in all those kinds of activities. Well, um, what were your parents like personally, and what was their attitude towards education? I would say um, they supported basic education, but they were not enthusiastic about advanced education. They saw education as a way of achieving a certain standard of living, but beyond a certain point it became really quite superfluous to them because they, they really hadn't experienced it themselves. So the idea of going to college and university uh, was really outside the realm. And uh, they, they did not encourage me, they did not encourage other siblings uh, to go on to higher education. In fact, out of six children, I was the only one who actually went to college. Wow. Though later on, uh, a number of my siblings did go on to community college and did various coursework and so on. But you were a real trailblazer that a way. A tr real trailblazer in that way. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is not the case today, with many of my nephews and nieces also uh, graduates of uh, university and so mm -hmm. on. But at that, in that era, in the era of the 50s and the 60s, this was not a priority at all. And how did your family or extended family react to your advanced education? In some ways, quite negatively. Uh, they saw me as being more uppity, mm -hmm. in a sense, than, uh, than they mm -hmm. were that I was trying to advance myself above my own social class and so on. Mm -hmm. But that didn't bother me because I knew what I wanted and I mm -hmm. had to focus on those goals. So I just mm -hmm. pursued what it is that uh, I felt to be very important and figured out a pathway for getting there. And you said you had this early idea of the professorate or academia. Was there a particular, you also had this interest in poverty. Was there a particular or place you saw yourself in academia, in grade school or elementary school? I don't know a particular place. Um, I know I wanted to be a professor, to be a researcher, to be a teacher, to be a role model to others, and I think um, that's really what very much uh, provided the motivation for the way in which I engaged myself. I had a very positive notion about what I could do to contribute to a resolution of some of the inequalities that I saw around me. And that came from reading, it came from meeting with people, and it came from the inspiration that I received from other adults who were part of my life also. Who would that be? Well, including my teachers mm -hmm. and uh, some members in the community uh, who were political activists. Mm -hmm. Can you really tell us about some of these people? Well, some of them were really very remarkable people, very modest means, who had very ambitious goals, who 
uh, were heads of community action programs uh, and sought to mobilize uh, people to do two things. One, to understand the sources of the contradictions in which they were trapped, but at the same time to take action to remove the sources of contradictions. Uh, and of course I refer to it as the process of consensitization where one engages in both reflection and action at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was always a source of inspiration for me. So what kind of community action initiatives, uh, what kind of groups were these? I think you uh, drives, various kinds of group drives to mm -hmm. get food to people who are hungry, to get clothing to those who really had very modest uh, ability to acquire more than the, the basic needs. Uh, very often we would raise money to pay people's rents when they couldn't afford to pay rents themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of activities were fairly common amongst uh, our group. Can you think of anything in high school or beyond that got you into the field of social work in particular? No, I think by the time I got to university, uh, college and university, I really was committed to an activist uh, orientation for my life. Uh, How that, was that fed or fueled in your high school year? Well, I think it came from, again, the study of, uh, of literature and philosophy, mm -hmm. that it opened, uh, that these two fields really opened a window for my understanding the structural nature of inequality that existed between and among people around mm -hmm. the world, particularly those born in what we today call developing countries or mm -hmm. least developing countries. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that made me extraordinarily angry, I must say, as a young mm -hmm. man, and uh, made me committed to try and engage very proactively in reducing either the inequality or in promoting more advanced development uh, for people within those societies. And that has pretty much been the story of uh, much of my adult life, really. Yeah, it's amazingly it's consistent, related, coherent, it's very, and coherent. It's very consistent. But I must say that the thing that uh, drives me has always been very internal. Uh, I have perceived and I've understood uh, certain things, and I understood what actions needed to be taken to correct them. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a scholar, as a university professor, I use my um, research as the vehicle mm -hmm. for bringing uh, national and international attention mm -hmm. to these kinds of disparities. Mm -hmm. And I do it in a way that uh, really has been very productive uh, mm -hmm. thus far. Have you, uh, so you had some naysayers as a young man in your, uh, terms of your family, extended family. Were there other naysayers throughout your life who may have discouraged your approach? Not you, really, no, okay. no. I think the, uh, the primary, uh, and I wouldn't quite call them naysayers, but I would say people who were less than supportive mm -hmm. uh, would have been at the family level, the local community level, okay. because they, they felt themselves to be in a particular position and needed to stay in that position. They, they felt that they could eke out an existence within the uh, system in which they found themselves. Mm -hmm. But you could imagine a much better life well, for them. I could imagine a much better life for them, mm -hmm. for sure. So what do you mean by structural uh, poverty or inequality? Well, I think there are certain dynamics that exist at the global level which are mirrored within each country that trap people in situations that are less than ideal, uh, and more particularly uh, in the situation of, uh, of poverty, which is what we've discussed a number of times. But also, in recent years, I've become very concerned about the plight of children and children who are being trafficked uh, around the world for either servitude, bondage, or in many cases for uh, sexual services. And uh, for the last five, six years, I've been very active in dealing with that issue and have been very successful uh, throughout the U.S. and throughout North America, in fact, in dealing with some of the basic problems that exist between the adult communities and the children communities as it relates to sexual exploitation of children. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem to have a real uh, kind of native optimism about try doing something about these I problems. I think that's very important. I think one has to constantly feel very optimistic, very positive 
that things can change and will change, and those changes will be positive for people. Could you feel that, that way? Comes even from, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, okay. it, it's something that's internal. So even in 1968, with the assassinations of Martin Luther King, yes, and Robert the sorrow Kennedy. and the tragedy of it, uh, I think I understood that we were moving in a particular direction, and uh, that direction could be sustained even with the loss of those very significant and important leaders in the movement, that there were enough people within uh, society that understood the nature of the problem and uh, would continue the cause even though the significant leaders uh, had been removed and removed in a very violent way. Could you think of times when you thought uh, uh, the road to progress in addressing some of these issues had stalled or gone the wrong direction completely? Well, for me, the area of working with uh, children in child sexual exploitation, which is an area that I think we share, uh, very often uh, the level of denial about the existence of the problem has been extraordinarily great. And that didn't discourage you when you saw no, that early it just, on? No, it just absolutely encouraged me to work even harder. And I worked closely with the U.S. Department of Justice, with the White House, with uh, various uh, departments of state and justice, and uh, was able to mobilize them to come along in a way very reluctant mm -hmm. participants initially, mm -hmm. but eventually in the end I had 14 federal agencies who bought wow. into the premise that uh, this was a major problem, not just for poor people in third world countries, mm -hmm. but for kids within developing countries, many of whom weren't poor at all, but were born in very affluent situations, but were engaging in personally quite destructive behavior. Well, um, before we get into that in more detail, um, can you tell me about uh, if there were any, you said philosophy and literature had an influence, were there any particular works that kind of knocked your socks off in terms of depicting inequality of the kind you saw growing up or even another kind? Well, it's very, any particular it's very interesting you would ask me that because uh, for me it was in Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespearean literature, whether one talks about King Lear or, or Hamlet or the other tragedies of uh, Shakespeare, who made it very, very clear through these depictions of very important characters, the structural nature of the problems that existed in human relationships, even at the very most personal level. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one place where I saw it. But I also saw it in the ancient literatures, in Latin and Greek, and uh, also in uh, the, the pre, I, sh I would say that even the pre-literature, mm -hmm. the Beowulfs and uh -huh. so on, uh -huh. uh, I could see it over and over and over again. It didn't matter what body of literature that I was uh, reading or trying to understand, mm -hmm. I could really see how the stratification systems that existed mm -hmm. within society that really reinforced very negative behavior on the part of people. So when you talk about structural disparity, you're, you're talking about social class to a degree. To a very different large degree. Okay. You know, but also economic uh, differences too. Social class would be part of it, but the economic disparities I, I think is, are even greater. So if uh, you or I were born in Bangladesh or in Sri Lanka, uh, the opportunities that we feel something that we can take for granted simply cannot be taken for granted by people in such societies who have to work very, very hard in order to move from step A to step B, and if they're lucky, to step C eventually. And in many places there's no opportunities for education. Very often there's yourself. no opportunity. Uh -huh. If you're in a scheduled class in India, at the Dalits, for example, at uh -huh. the very bottom of the social structure, you will never leave that class it will be an extraordinary individual who would leave it. But on the other hand, we have someone like a Martin Luther King, who's born of parents who were educated, but in a very poor community, who exercise enormous leadership in dealing with problems of poverty and disparity, and in the end became a hero who really brought about an enormous revolution 
within uh, a very affluent society that, of course, has resulted in much more equality between mm -hmm. and among people of different races and different uh, socioeconomic statuses. Mm -hmm. Because even to be well off, economically well off and black, doesn't necessarily guarantee you an advantage position in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, King really provided the, the way for uh, bringing about change of mm -hmm. a very fundamental nature in the social structure of society. Were there other people like that that inspired you in terms of leader as a young man, in terms of leaders who could address issues of inequality or social justice? Well, for many years I was a member of the uh, of what's called SNCC, mm -hmm. which was the Southern uh, Leadership uh, Conference, which dealt mostly between racial disparities, mm -hmm. but uh, more importantly it dealt with economic disparities mm -hmm. between people. And of course the poorest of the poor were people of color mm -hmm. rather than uh, people who were of white, but uh, people who were white also experienced exactly the same problems as people of color. So mm -hmm. I think that also provided a source of great support for me. Um, in a sense, then, you you had you seem to have this kind of world view that uh, everybody's your brother or sister, regardless of no question skin about color. It. And um, is that kind of tolerance something you saw growing up? No, I didn't experience it growing up. I, I experienced considerable intolerance. But in my own world view, I experienced each person as a brother, a sister, uh, someone that I could help, someone who could be helpful to me in turn. And uh, where all that comes from, I think, is just a matter of internal reflection uh -huh. and uh, finding one's own path uh, to be more positive and and more uh, aggressive in trying to bring about greater equality between peoples, mm -hmm. wherever they are in the world. This, this has certainly informed all of my current work. So tell me about King Lear and what that taught you about social oh, inequality. Oh my goodness, dear King Lear, a tragic figure in all respects, and, and, and a man, a king, who in the end was uh, betrayed by those closest to him, uh, that was a very important uh, lesson, that no matter how high in life your formal station is, you still had people who were below you who could betray you, and you could lose everything in the end. Uh, the same is true with, uh, with Hamlet, mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. that uh, here he is, the prince of a kingdom, mm -hmm. a father who's murdered, a mother who marries the uh, murderer, Mm -hmm. and uh, drives uh, Hamlet almost insane mm -hmm. with, uh, with his anger uh, over the, uh, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are many situations like that mm -hmm. that I could easily uh, allude to. It was part of Lear's problem that he, uh, even though he had the title, that he gave up his wealth? Did that make him more impotent in that world? No question about it. No mm -hmm. question. The title without wealth and with wealth, the power to exercise to influence over society really made an enormous difference. So then that's, that's God's gets, so right. to speak. I would say so. Uh -huh. And that would reinforce in you this idea of the uh, structural inequality and the, the plight of the poor Correct. as something you wanted to dedicate your life to. Correct. And I would say that's, that's been consistent throughout my entire career. So what about, what brought you from uh, literature and other studies as an undergraduate to social work? Oh, uh, social work and social policy combined. Okay. Uh, what I realized is that to bring about change, it was not enough to just be angry and to organize small groups to take positive action, but that we needed to really work on the structure of society itself. And so that in all of my work at the postgraduate and subsequent levels, it really has been understanding the, the nature, the dynamics, the extent of social inequality and the factors that influence that within various nations of the world. As you may or may not know that uh, my own area of research deals with uh, global issues 
and I monitor social developments in some 170 countries of the world. And I monitor them very closely in terms of the structural aspects of societies that make possible opportunities for people or frustrate opportunities mm -hmm. for people achieving greater equality between and amongst uh, themselves. And this was your vision when you uh, got your MSW and then doctorate in social work? Correct. What got you well, into well, How did you learn MSW, about the field of social work? Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, my wife was very interested in social work and uh, I had more free time than she, so I wrote away for all the catalogs and started to read the catalogs and said, my God, here's the way in which I can put together the kind of philosophical agenda and concerns that I had with a real world uh, profession that could make a difference. And uh, I very uh, quickly made the adaptation from simply thinking about issues and of course working informally through various groups on uh, issues of poverty uh, to uh, a profession which was de dedicated to this sort of thing, to more prevention and the promotion of human rights of people, mm -hmm. access to uh, more equitable uh, justice mm -hmm. uh, on the parts of various groups and so on. This made total sense to me. Did you think about uh, social work practice uh, initially at all? Is it well, I did. I you? worked 10 years as a clinician. Mm -hmm. uh, was this I, uh, clinical social work or, the, uh, uh, or not necessarily? The education I got at Penn was not clinical social work mm -hmm. particularly. It was more generic. Mm -hmm. And uh, my field of study there was really with small groups and small mm -hmm. group behavior. But after uh, Penn, I went on to postgraduate work in psychiatric social work at the Menneker Foundation in Topeka, Kansas. Hmm. I also got time. a postdoc there, yeah. Oh, okay, uh -huh. all right. Mm -hmm. So, and that was really very important for me. But a lot of it I exercised by working in the community by with uh, Native American people, with uh, African Americans who lived in the Topeka community, and with other minority groups, which make up quite a sizable portion of the uh, uh, Topeka slash Kansas communities, if you will. So this is in your off time, basically. This was uh -huh. my off time, uh -huh. but it was really quite a wonderful experience. And then the, these 10 years, where did you work as a staff social worker? At Menninger's. At, okay. and oh. they, uh, for three years, and seven years I was in private practice. I did uh, clinical practice. Where was this? In Philadelphia, uh -huh. along with uh, my work as a university professor. I was a new assistant professor at Penn and maintain my private practice for about seven years after uh, I began my employment at Penn. Is that not unusual in today's terms? I think it's really quite unusual for mm -hmm. a person with the perspective that, uh, that I have. But also even just to be able to do clinical work as an academic, isn't that I unusual? I think it's very hard. I think it's very mm -hmm. hard to do both, especially for a man who likes to travel the world and mm -hmm. uh, visit with people in different societies, mm -hmm. uh, given the clinical responsibilities of patient care, uh, it became an oxymoron for me to, to do that. What kind of practice so did you up. have? It was, it was primarily individuals, families, and small groups. And what from what strata or structure? Mostly they were people who were what we would call today borderline personalities. Hmm. Uh, people who are barely making it, very heavily substance uh, abuse, abusive mm -hmm, or addicted mm -hmm. in one way or another, uh, but people who are very marginal in terms mm -hmm. of their capacity. And I just learned enormously from them. On the affluent side of the practice, I also had many uh, corporate executives and the uh, spouses or children of corporate executives. And how would they, and how would, how no would they hear about you? or? They ever practice. get referred based on reputation. Mm -hmm. People would refer to me based on uh, the experiences that others had had with me. And what I realized is that the very well off and the very worse off, uh, there was very little difference between them. Mm -hmm. The only difference was whether or not they had resources to pay me mm -hmm. sufficiently for the <laughs> clinical <laughs> services that I was providing. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, uh, to play devil's advocate, there's some that might say uh, that many social work positions really, uh, and many social workers end up being apologists for the status quo to the uh -huh. extent that in their, in their day job they're 
they're working for the system of inequality, they're, they're working for the health care system, for example, that maybe uh, denies care to so many people. How would you answer that question? I would say that was never my, uh, never a concern for me. Uh, I was not there representing the, the state or the, uh, the status quo, if you will. I was there really interested in trying to understand the needs of uh, the individuals who came into my life through practice and to figure out what would be an appropriate solution to the problems that they were experiencing. And I didn't have an agenda whereby I was trying to force them into particular boxes or particular ways of behavior and so on. Well, I'm just, I guess I'm asking you to defend other parts of the social work world where people are working for agencies or um, do, you think, do you think that argument is, is fair to say that some are, are uh, not necessarily improving the situation but merely working within? Well, I think there's a very large element of social control within the social work profession, there's no question about it, because of the uh, marginal nature of many of the clients with whom they're working, mm -hmm. particularly those who come in conflict with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. or those who are poor because of uh, problems that are innately within them rather than within the, the uh, society itself. But my experience with uh, social workers, and I've worked with social workers for 40-some years now, and of course have trained thousands of social mm -hmm. workers, is that that is not the predominant uh, mode at all. People are very much interested in changing the system to make the system more responsive to the needs of people. But they do find that uh, certain individuals, a selected group of individuals, will exploit in the most negative way possible uh, the resources that are made available to them. Mm -hmm. And is most of the social action work done outside of the working hours? I mean, it's very can you actually find a way to get paid for pursuing your passion? Uh, it's very interesting. Social passion. work is a very broad profession. Those who are working for agencies providing direct services to individuals and families, you find much more of the social control mechanism operating. Those who are in advocacy, education, public change, social change type organizations, which are about half of the field, are interested more in structural dynamics and structural issues. Uh, much of my work at uh, Penn which is in the School of Social Policy and Practice really deals with uh, social workers who are really interested in mobilizing people to change some of the macro uh, inequalities that exist within society. That's great. So it's a very diverse discipline It's quite that diverse, way. yes. It will work with people who are individually quite inept and unable to care for themselves and require the system to move in and provide for their care and others who, on the other, the other extreme, are really working to bring about broad-based social change, mm -hmm. such as change between races, between people of different ethnic and religious backgrounds, and so on. And increasingly, my work for 20 years has been more international. So I prepare, uh, the majority of my students, I prepare for work globally for dealing mm -hmm. with uh, issues at the international level. So. Um in your clinical work, you became aware that uh, many of the problems or the only diff major differences were differences in income or structural inequality. Is which that right? were not the defining differences uh -huh. between people, right? That having a lot of money or having very little money uh, really made very little difference in terms of many of the social issues that people were struggling with. So what led you to to leave that clinical work and develop your uh, your other work. For example, um, the Gallup organization in 2007 has just gotten a bright idea of looking at global well-being throughout the world. It sounds like you've been doing that for a long time. I've been doing that for a very long time, since about the uh, middle 1960s. Okay, I've, so I've been looking I think at, you scooped them uh, by a few years. By a few years. Uh, what moved you from uh, that private practice focus and social work training focus into this international? It's very interesting, Dr. Frisch. It's not a, for me, it's not a matter of moving from one to the other, but a continuum okay. of work that uh, one sees people in a variety of contexts and appreciates 
the commonality that exists across those contexts, uh, that people who become victimized by unfair, unjust systems uh, are very important for understanding the nature of the systems themselves. And if one is to bring about greater equality, greater balance, uh, one has to, of course, work at the systemic level because the individuals mm -hmm. alone cannot do it. Well, when did you move from, say, a concern about poverty and social justice in the United States to another country? What was the first was country you looked at? 1978. I accepted a Fulbright grant mm -hmm. to um, uh, the People's Republic of Iran, which is now the Islamic uh, Republic of uh, Iran. And it was there that I really saw the uh, profound impact that, uh, and change possibilities that existed within a revolutionary movement. I never expected during the six months that I stayed there that a society would totally change from A to B mm -hmm. as, in such a profound way mm -hmm. as uh, occurred within Iran. But I have always chosen to work in societies that are experience, experiencing tremendous uh, social instability mm -hmm. and, uh, as a process of going through great change. So countries like Iraq interest me mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm. very much as uh, the Sunnis and the Shias, mm -hmm. and, uh, the Kurds all try to come together as a common people and so mm -hmm. on. This kind of problem interests me uh, enormously. Well, it's interesting because the outcome of the Gallup studies and some of the work in Isqual has shown that that kind of turmoil breeds the deepest discontent and lowest quality of life we see in many countries. In the short term. Yes, but and over the long term, it may not be the case. It can be a very positive. You know, I mean, so, we see it even in rich countries like Belgium. Uh -huh. You have the French-speaking uh, people of Wallonia. You have the mm -hmm. Flemish-speaking people of Franconia. You have the German populations, all in a country of only 10 million people, mm -hmm. with enormous social strife uh, mm -hmm. as a consequence. Uh, well, and, let's get back to Iran. What did you see there in terms of inequality that moved oh, you? Oh, it was the inequalities were profound. I mean, those who were associated with the Shah and the Shah's regime, particularly the military, live very affluent, very uh, rich, and very wonderful lives. But they were only a few percentage of the total population. Most of the people lived in the most dire circumstances, even in the capital city. While the Shah was busy building a great stadium to show as a, a centerpiece of, of his regime to the world, you had four and five block neighborhoods sharing a single water pipe uh, in order to uh, to draw down their fresh water supply for the day. And what was their what kind of living structures or housing did they have? Very difficult, very impoverished circumstances. What did their houses look like or their living They would quarters? basically be mud huts that they would uh, put up. And whereas the others were living in uh, marble homes. I must say even I was living in a, a home completely made of uh, marble with beautiful Persian carpets and so on. Uh, it was really so quite you couldn't a be remarkable corrupted, contrast. Though. No, I was never <laughs> corrupted. And my home was adjacent to uh, what's known as the Great Blue Mosque. And there was the Blue Mosque where most of the uh, revolutionary activities took place. Mm -hmm. because it's in the mosque only that people could come together as groups. Mm -hmm. Outside mm -hmm. of the mosque, people were never able to be together mm -hmm. in groups. Interesting. It's against the law. So um, when did your first writing about inequality uh, The uh, very first article I wrote on this was 1976, mm -hmm. which took uh, two years to do, uh, where I developed a model for... Um, beginning to place nations on a continuum of uh, equality and inequality and but very importantly to understand what factors contributed to uh, both of these phenomena. Mm -hmm. And that came out uh, in 1976 and was done in consultation with uh, leaders from throughout the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I traveled extensively and I invited many people to visit with me at on the Penn campus. So this and is pre-Iran? This pre is pre-Iran. So, so that was not your first that, foray. What, what, how did you first, what, what was the first step you took towards international cooperation? Well, I'd say it was in the early, very early 1970s. It began first with an intellectual 
exercise and a process that engaged people from different parts of the world and then followed up with the field work such as Iran, Norway, many other countries. Mm -hmm. So um, had you been working on poverty in the United States first? I had. And uh, what made you move outward from that? Well, because I, I didn't see any difference between poverty in the, in the United States versus poverty in other parts of the world, particularly when you looked at specific groups that were at a greater risk of uh, being impoverished, the elderly, the children, people of color, and so on. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that that was the same pattern that existed in other parts of the world, but I didn't know it at that time. Well, where, what was the first uh, thing you read or did that, that, that made that awareness come what, to light? Oh, that came in the 50s and through my, my readings of uh, literature, Steinbeck and uh, all of those things that, that taught us about the, the problems of, uh, of people living in impossible circumstances, uh, the Dust Bowl days of mm -hmm. Oklahoma and so on, mm -hmm. the impoverishment of people even in Monterey, California. Yes, so uh, how did you move from the grapes the of wrath to uh, poverty in other countries? For me, country? it came very naturally. Okay. It came just very naturally. Was there one country you were interested in, or, uh, or you decided to start a movement of cooperation with scholars, you said? Well, that began, I would say, about 1973 in work that I did with uh, the United Nations. How did you get involved um, with them? It's very interesting. The uh, first development decade, the United Nations has a program of development decades that goes back now to the 1950s. In 1960, all of us recognized that the first development decade failed to achieve its goals. And the question was, why did it fail? Well, much of the failure was really resulted, it resulted from the overstatement of the goals themselves, which was the elimination of poverty among countries with very little understanding of the factors that influenced uh, poverty. How did you get asked to be on this, or how did you get involved? Uh, the Secretary General of an international non-governmental organization asked me to help develop a, a metric that would be different from the usual um, economic metrics mm -hmm. that were used to measure social development. And how did you know this person? I met her casually at a uh, cocktail party, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, she knew of my interests, and of course I knew of her interests. She was a Swiss German mm -hmm. uh, who herself had fled the Nazis during mm -hmm. the uh, Second World War, and she understood the nature of oppression from that point of view, and she recognized that I was interested in uh, broader issues, and invited me to New York to meet with her staff and subsequently with staff mm -hmm. of uh, the United Nations. And uh, what I committed myself to at that point was to develop a provisional model for uh, beginning to measure the changes that take place within societies over time in relation to a predetermined set of goals that were other than simply economic goals that had to do more with justice and with equality between people. What was her name and discipline? Her name, Kate Baker. Katsky, uh -huh. K-A-T-Z-I. Uh, was the Secretary General of the International Council on Social Welfare. Hmm. And uh, her role and the role of the Council was really to promote uh, greater equality between people around the world. What became very clear to me is that the United States, despite the robustness and the size of its economy and the wealth of its economy, mm -hmm. also harbored m most of the world's poor, at least within rich countries that we had one-fourth uh, to one-fifth of the American population living below the poverty line, most of whom were people of color, and most of whom were people living in particular geo geographic areas within the, uh, the U.S. Do you see that as a problem today? It still is the same. The rate of poverty in the U.S. has virtually remained unchanged. How many people is that about? About 40 million Americans. The one factor that has changed is the, uh, the faces. Instead of them uh, being uh, aged Americans, uh, they now are Americans of color. People who are older have succeeded very well under the social security programs that mm -hmm. we've developed. So we've been able to reduce poverty among the aged rather dramatically. But uh, poverty for children, one, every, one out of every five children in the U.S. this day as we speak 
lives under the poverty line, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is just an unbelievable situation in such a wealthy country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that among people of color, that the vast majority of uh, the males are either in prison or under court supervision of one type or another. Mm -hmm and uh, which, of course, increases the likelihood of uh, poverty and, and uh, all the problems associated with poverty that come from that. Do you see any particular solutions that uh, we can pursue as a people? A new administration, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A more informed, a more educated, a more open uh, administration. So at the time and of our interview, it's President uh, George, uh, George W. George Bush. George W. Bush, yeah. mm -hmm. I think an administration that finds poverty to be too expensive for us to afford uh, is really what's needed. Poverty is an enormously costly reality in rich countries because of all of the uh, effects that are associated with it, the crime, the drug use, and all of the other problems. Uh, I've met with the Prime Minister of Denmark on, on this very issue. We've discussed it rather extensively. And he said to me, point blank, he says, poverty is just too expensive for us to afford. Mm -hmm. We won't permit income poverty to exist within our society. And this has been true of most of the social democratic uh, states of uh, Northern and Western Europe. All of, mm -hmm. I say throughout the whole Eurozone, mm -hmm. most of the uh, OECD or members mm -hmm. of the uh, the rich countries find poverty just too expensive a phenomenon to afford. And the, the genesis of that, was it in Germany with Bismarck and some Bismarck of his Bismarck in the part? late 1880s uh -huh. uh, developed the Social Security program, not knowing, of course, that it would be adopted so extensively uh, by other nations of the world, but it certainly has been the most successful social experiment of any of the social programs that we've had. Well, this UN official must have felt like she died and went to heaven because she got another she got a great deal from you. <laughs> so much she's got. so uh, you worked together on this model and metric, and where did that lead you? It led me to do uh, periodic reviews of the changing social si situation in the world, and every five years I publish a new social index of social progress, which really measures the extent to which countries of the world succeed in achieving or not achieving their basic social goals. And uh, I do this, is called the Index of Social Progress, and every five years I publish a, a new update to it. And how in the world do you amass, what kind of data do you amass, oh, and how do you go through it? it what helped you have? An enormous difficulty, but I must say I've had a lot of influence on the kinds of data that international organizations now collect and report. In the oh, early great. years, we had a great paucity of information mm -hmm. of a social nature. We had great wealth of information about economic mm -hmm. metrics, mm -hmm. per capita income level, and size of economy, and mm -hmm. imports and exports, and trade, and all of those things. We had very little about infant child mortality rates, mm -hmm. violence against women, mm -hmm. uh, health uh, factors, and so on. Mm -hmm. But I've been very fortunate in being able to influence the types and the way and the frequency within which mm -hmm. Uh, these data are now collected uh, internationally, and so they come into the mo a particular model of social development that I've developed and I've used extensively. And, and even as we sit, I'm now finalizing the, uh, hmm. the data for the most current years. And who's, who helps you in collecting this data or processing it? Thank heavens for students. Graduate okay. students are okay. a great blessing. <laughs> um, uh, they both want to learn and they have enormous energy. And So how many talent. indices per country are we talking about? I use 40 indices. And how many and countries? Ten sectors for 170 countries of the world. Wow, and that's much more than Gallup. They, they interview about, they're interviewing 130 people from 130 countries. Uh -huh. but, uh, but I'm able to collect data now and report data for 170 countries. So this international work, tabulating data from 170 countries, all this emanated from the work you, you did for this, the UN, uh, this person you met at a cocktail party at the UN? Yes, I would say that and you've it, stayed it with began it. there and stayed with it uh -huh. since uh, probably about 1970. And how did you ever, how do you get an audience with the Pope, so to speak, where you can talk to the heads of these countries? I find knowledge is a great source of power and influence. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I do have by way of influence is an understanding and, uh, and knowledge about uh, situations. And uh, this is really the source of my entrada, as our mm -hmm. Spanish colleagues mm -hmm. would say, into uh, these very important circles. Can you think of a, 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 the leader of a country or important figure you've talked to and actually had some kind of influence on their well, view been, of poverty or the data they collect? Oh, there are many countries that I've worked with very closely. Uh, Denmark, for example, mm -hmm. which always ranks very high on the uh, index. Mm -hmm. I've been able to work with their international development agency called DENIDA. So I've you're preaching to the choir there, though, right? I mean, they, I are, am. they, could, they, they care they have, about... Uh, subjective quality of life and uh, and the, the physical quality, the physical of, life. quality of life for their people not just economic progress right and okay. there uh, the concern is with what their role should be in dealing with nations beyond mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. uh, this I do with the Swedes with the Dutch with even with uh, the Americans the US mm -hmm. uh, agency mm -hmm. for international development okay. and with other organizations mm -hmm. so I have access to all of these groups mm -hmm. Uh, because of the special knowledge and understanding that comes from my data. And I can uh, provide them with particular prescriptions, if you will, remedies mm -hmm. for, uh, for countries. So uh, certainly one challenge is immigration. And uh, in Sweden, for example, they have an African uh, uh, Swede who's uh, their culture minister, and she's very concerned that Africans moving to Sweden are not picking up the culture, right? And I guess, uh, and uh, so, what do you th what do you think about immigration and the extent to which countries should mandate or encourage assimilation of some kind? Well, from my point of view, the uh, solution to the kinds of problems that I'm concerned with, which is regional, national, international poverty and mm -hmm. inequality will not be solved by moving people across continents. Mm -hmm. So the Swedish idea of moving large numbers of Africans, particularly North Africans, mm -hmm. into Sweden solves the Swedish problem of a labor force, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really solve the cultural problems of making North Africans into Swedes. Mm -hmm. uh, North Africans and people of other regions of the wor world really wish to be in their own societies and their own mm -hmm. cultures and wish to contribute to the development of those societies and should be given the opportunity to do that. On the other hand, the Swedes have chosen not to have children. They have fewer than one child per couple mm -hmm. in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And their population is aging very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So they have two trends that are very problematic, a very mm -hmm. rapidly increasing aging population and a very low fertility rate. Mm -hmm. And the only way to keep the economy moving is by bringing people into the society who are not Swedes. This is true in Norway, this is true even in Germany. It's How true about Italy? In Italy, uh -huh. it's also true. Uh, that they, all of these countries really depend on large numbers, and by the way, the U.S. as well, all depend on large numbers of people coming from other societies. In the United States, we have between 12 and 20 million undocumented workers mm -hmm. in the United States as we're speaking mm -hmm. uh, today and an unemployment rate of less than 5%. So the economy is absorbing all of these undocumented workers into its productive uh, capacity. And this has to do with a relatively low birth rate, uh, certainly not a birth rate that would be equivalent to the way in which the economy itself is expanding. But the Europeans are in a particular problem, uh, have a particular problem because their birth rates are extraordinarily low and their populations are very old uh, and increasing in age quite rapidly. So um, in the United States, is it a problem if, uh, if many of these immigrants uh, have no education or skills that they're bringing? Well, it's a problem only in the sense that they're not recognized and aren't entitled to the kinds of benefits that you and I would take for granted. Uh, whether it's Social Security, access to public education, access to basic health care, then it becomes a very significant problem. But the fact that we have, let's say, 20 million undocumented workers is not a problem other than the fact that they're undocumented. 
they mm -hmm. can't really draw down benefits in the same way or at a level that's appropriate to their contribution to the economy. Okay. But we can solve that problem. We could easily solve it. Simply by giving them full rights or citizenship? By giving them full rights. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know any other way to do it. I don't know how mm -hmm. we will ever um, send 20 million people back to the countries of origin mm -hmm. and at the same time maintain the economic uh, viability of the U.S. Do you think we need to close the borders in any, at any point? Or well, I think the borders to need to be more tightly controlled, but mm -hmm. I, I feel that for a different set of reasons. And it has to do with trafficking and people. Okay. Uh, well, that's a good point. Because now, I know you've done work in philanthropy. A friend of mine, uh, Bernard Rappaport, has a foundation where he gives about $5 million a year to uh -huh. the poorest of the poor, because he actually is a Russian Jewish immigrant that uh -huh. grew up in... Uh, Barrios of San Antonio and was treated like dirt and so he has a, he also like you so he, he has understands a, he has yeah. a very soft spot for the poor and the despised or discriminated against but his view uh, which is and uh, which is interesting is that uh, his view is that their the borders should be closed somewhat because we have so many poor people who haven't been uh, educated properly as it is and that uh, one we should encourage their uh, they're learning the English language as a, as a requirement for citizenship. What do you think about that? Well, I like his notion of providing philanthropy to the poorest of the poor. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not so sure that the borders necessarily need to be closed or that English needs to be the only language of the United States. Uh, it is clear that English has served us well, but so too has been an integrated rail system and an integrated uh, airline system, if you will, that people can go fairly quickly across the country from one point to, to the next. But I think we do have to take cognizance of uh, the realities of, of who these people are that are being brought into the country or come into the country on their, their own. Uh, they do speak a different language in most cases and have a different contribution to make to us. Every new cohort that has entered the United States has brought something different and something very special and I would say very wonderful to the U.S., whether it's the most recent immigration of Russians into the U.S. or the Irish at the turn of the century or the Italians at the turn of the century. Uh, more recently, the Vietnamese and the Hmong people, they've all brought something very unique to the American cultural fabric and I think that has to be respected. I think the goal is not simply to put everyone in a blender and to come out with a mix that looks exactly uh, the same in all situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we need a certain amount of social fabric that keeps us together as a united people. And finding that balance, I think, is a bit tricky at this point. So um, let's get back to your your recent forthcoming book, what is the, what's the status of the world in terms of inequality and what solutions do you have to offer? For well, that? I would say the, uh, in terms of social inequality, in many ways the world has gotten far better. Uh, when I began my work in the 1960s on this, the average life expectation for people in developing countries was barely 40. It is now 55 years. And of course, in the U.S., it's 80 to 85 years, depending on whether you're a woman or a, a man. Uh, Health care has become much more available to many people, particularly through emergency rooms for the poor. They, they can't be turned away from uh, mm -hmm. uh, the provision of basic care, even though it's very costly for us to provide primary care through an emergency room situation and so on. But there's really, they're really not being denied care. They're not being denied care, uh, particularly in an emergent situation. Mm -hmm. And many people have access to public education today. All around the world, we find that uh, enrollment rates in primary education are approximating almost 100% mm -hmm. of children under the age of 10, let's mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Secondary education, there's still a big gap to fill, mm -hmm. only about 20, 30, 40% depending on which region of the world you look at, of children have access to primary education. At the post-secondary, at the college and university level, you find a lot of disparities existing, but increasingly favoring women. 
which I think is a terrific uh, achievement. Isn't that interesting? Even in developing countries. Even developing countries. The men go into the workforce and the women continue their education. And in time, of course, it will uh, equalize itself, I think. But in the short term, it creates many imbalances because you have highly educated women who are forced to marry or partner with uh, men who have significantly lower levels of education than they enjoy. You see it in the Philippines, you see it in many other uh, countries of Southeast Asia. Increasingly, you're seeing it in the United States as well. The majority of uh, people who go to university in the U.S. now are women. Mm -hmm. And you see it in all the professional schools and disciplines. I'm sure in psychology, uh, the majority of students are for a long time. It's been women. Yeah. Yeah. Social work, of course, mm -hmm. uh, eighty percent of the population of students are women. Mm -hmm. But at law school, veterinary school, medical school, it's at least fifty percent would be women, uh, which is really quite a remarkable change. Even in schools of engineering, uh, we're we're seeing tremendous rises in level of female education. Some so, social critics would say, though, that's because the men are leaving the professions that, where they can't make a ton of money. Is there some truth to that? I mean, no. I would say men feel the need to enter the workforce more uh, at a more rapid rate than women do at this point. Uh, so they're not are, going into business. Going they're not to, opting out of uh, being a physician or a lawyer and going into business to make more money or no, going into law. No, because they're not making more money. In fact, uh, we know that there's a very definite high correlation between level of education and income capacity, income earning capacity. Okay. Well, that's a good point. Um, any other uh, highlights from your your latest report and perhaps based on experience? What are the countries you feel most intimate knowledge of? Is China not one of them? China or? is one of them. China, uh -huh. I have spent a lot of time in China. And I will say that uh, the region of the world that is on the move, that's making the most significant progress, has traditionally been one of the poorest regions of the world, which is East Asia. We need only look at uh, countries like Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, China now, and see enormous wealth uh, accruing to the benefit of uh, the residents of those countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's still great disparity and mm -hmm. inequality and unevenness in its mm -hmm. distribution at this point, but the fact that they are growing more rapidly than the old countries of mm -hmm. Europe nor and North America mm -hmm. is really uh, something very special to take note of. Well, it's striking to me to uh, uh, see the uh, the Disneyland Park in Hong Kong, yes. which my understanding is for it's for middle newly middle class Chinese to right. vacation. Well, so is that average a income level in Hong Kong is not much different from average income level in the U.S. So you don't have to be well off in Hong Kong to go to Disneyland. Right, but they're, they're anticipating a lot of mainland, ch newly uh, middle class mainland Chinese, Chinese to come. who are coming in. This is true. Uh -huh. This is true, yes. But these are mostly residents of the coastal cities or the major urban centers that are okay. close to the coasts uh -huh. where tremendous development has taken place. So we have about a third of the Chinese that are comfortably part of the middle class and a smaller percentage, of course, part of the upper class. But the real problems for China is central China and western China. And as you move away from the coast and move farther to the, uh, the west, you see uh, a world that's not unlike Pearl Buck's description of the good earth. Mm, yes, I'm aware uh, of that. People who are living in very desperate, very impoverished uh, circumstances because they don't have the same opportunities at all. Children find it very difficult even to go to school because parents can't afford uniforms or the books or the very small tuition that's now charged to children. When you look at solutions to structural inequality, is is the, the type of government important to you? Do you see Extremely the, important. So how, how do you see the role of the Chinese government in perpetuating this poverty? Well, I think in the short term, probably China can continue on its current path, but over the long term, the government has to be much more open, much more democratic than it is at this point. Every model that we've tested in uh, the various studies that we've done have shown that a vigorous market economy depends on a uh, vigorous uh, polity, that is to say a democratic, more open polity. Mm -hmm. China has said that it will have 
a free market with Chinese characteristics. Mm -hmm. What they really mean is a free market under communist control. Yeah. But this is not sustainable because people mm -hmm. will simply not put up with it. And for the short term, they can do this, but for the long term, it will, there will have to be fundamental change. And what's interesting to me is with my work with the Chinese at the highest level of uh, the government is that they find it themselves difficult to, to, to define what they mean by communism because it doesn't apply to the Chinese situation today. But what they're not yet prepared to do is to really open the political system to uh, multi-parties, to uh, public organization, to private entities mm -hmm. that have great wealth and, uh, and can be influential within the society. They struggle very, very hard with this. Um, some Chinese have told me that the, the deal struck with the government after Tiananmen Square was to allow a lot of economic freedom if people would just shut up about the political... That's, well, that's it. ...sort of a marriage made in hell, perhaps. But that's, you're saying that can continue... For the, the short term, but is, not for the long term. Is the economic growth part of their own undoing in terms of people's access to the Internet? No or question about it. This is what will money. force the political change that China, which is growing at the rate of 10 to 11 to 13 percent even per year, uh, which is an, a remarkable level of economic expansion, ultimately will have to change the political structure of it to uh, sustain that development over the long term. Is there another country particularly near and dear to your heart that you look at particularly? India I spend quite a lot of attention mm -hmm. on because India will soon be the most populous nation on earth. You know, when you combine India and China, four out of every ten people on the planet are either Chinese or Indian. Wow. And India is, of course, the world's largest democracy with the most political parties mm -hmm. and a very vigorous, very dynamic uh, economic system under democratic uh, principles. Mm -hmm. So India is a country that uh, interests me a great deal, and I will spend some time there even this summer looking a little further into uh, the factors that are both inhibiting as well as promoting further development within the society. Are there any other research milestones you want to, you can tell us about in terms of your work? Uh, well, I guess the I guess the area of white slavery we haven't really touched on. We, That's been we a haven't recent. touched on that uh, very much. Uh, I'm increasingly concerned about the abuse of human beings, particularly the most vulnerable in our society, mm -hmm. and the commercialization. It used to be that children were part of advertisements that would promote the sale of products in the same way that women used to sleep themselves over mm -hmm. a car, and they would mm -hmm. be part of the commercial mm -hmm. aspect of yeah. selling the car. Well, now children have become the product that's being sold. And we're dealing with tens of millions of children around the world who are being trafficked and moved uh, between countries strictly for commercial sexual purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, an area of great concern and great problem for me. And it's also, uh, do they not uh, come into the U.S. at times and set up brothels and move out well, before they get caught? It's not or? just foreign children that come into the U.S. Mm -hmm. Ninety percent of the children involved in, as commercial sex workers in the U.S are in fact American citizens. Hmm. They're our own children. Hmm. And they are involved in movement across uh, the country the same mm -hmm. way that those who come from international nations. Uh, uh, and how are they being recruited in the U.S.? They're being recruited much the same way, mostly through their own peer group, uh, who can show them expensive jewelry or beautiful clothes or opportunities that uh, many of these uh, less fortunate children have, and they recruit them into uh, commercial sex work simply as a way of accumulating the material goods that our society is able to produce for them. And what prevents these sex workers from uh, from going out on their own? What keeps them under a, a, some kind of a organized crime boss? Or something? Well, I think in the case of uh, girls, the, the pattern among uh, commercially exploited female children is not unlike that among uh, women who also are engaged in prostitution or sex work. Uh, 
there is the system of Johns and uh, an organized network that really keeps these children uh, under uh, very close wraps. Boys are not part of that kind of network. Boys are much more entrepreneurial, particularly as they age. And in fact, one of the uh, surprises in the research that I've done is the extent to which the boys become the managers of their own uh, brothels, if you will. Hmm. That they recruit girls and they recruit other boys hmm. at a younger age, and the boys become managers in a sense. So a lot of boys don't have pimps, that kind of system. Not at all. Where people are it's, terrorized. It's exceptional. Or, uh -huh. What about uh, cases uh, where um, young men and women are brought into countries under false pretenses? Have you seen that a lot? I see that quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's done at the corporate level. It's done even at the ambassadorial level. That is where embassies sponsor uh, children to come in. What's an example of a corporate or country that... Well, I, I'd, I'd be reluctant to mention a particular okay. country's name. How about a corporation? But corporations, they bring in people as house workers, and uh, ultimately these children wind up being uh, engaged in sexual servitude to the corporate executives or to children in the corporate executives' uh, families. Uh, this has been a real problem for Dominican Republicans and for Haitians and for others in the Caribbean. That's part of their culture, the it's corporations the culture. that you have. You make prostitutes available to the executives and Absolutely. business people. Uh -huh. Absolutely. What are other? Uh, what are some of the other most egregious uh, situations you've seen in terms of white slavery that upset you the most? Particular countries or? Well, I think in terms of the the U.S., the number of uh, children who are recruited to go abroad. Hmm. Uh, we have quite a large number of uh, young children who travel to Mexico, travel to Canada, and engage in sexual services in those countries because they live very close to border areas. But we also have a large number of children who are recruited to go to Tokyo, to Seoul, mm -hmm. to Taipei, to Hong Kong uh, because of their fair skin and blue eyes and light hair mm -hmm. are considered to be much more attractive and appealing than uh, the middle mass of kids who normally uh, would be in those trafficking, in the trafficking circles of those countries. Uh, and that number is really quite substantial, much more than one realizes. But here again, uh, as in the social development work you've done, you've had a big impact, you told us earlier, about this uh, child trafficking. We have. We, uh, I've been uh, successful in having a White House conference on this topic. And we've had this is something you organized? Or? Organized wow. with uh, the White House staff. Uh, we've extended now the uh, alert system, what's called the Amber Alert System, across the country. We've established all Can you tell us what country. that is? Uh, Amber Alert is when a child is missing for longer than one hour. Mm -hmm. A notice goes out all over the country with the child's picture. Mm -hmm. And every locality, all police authorities, uh, are alerted to the fact that this child is missing and may in fact be a victim. We know that if such children are gone for longer than 24 hours that they're likely to be killed, that they will, they simply won't just be recruited into sex work, but they're, they're likely to be killed. So we've been able to extend the Amber Alert system to all countries. We've also been able to extend the age of sexual consent to 16 years. And um, in some ways it works against children, in other ways it works in favor of children. But now we have all 50 states agreeing that the age at which uh, children may engage in uh, sexual activities cannot be younger than 16 and still be uh, within uh, the law. We've so how did you get into the, the White House in this case? I mean, why would they pay any attention to you or take your phone oh. call? I mean, there's so many academics that... Uh, how do you get that access? I'll tell you, I'm a very stubborn person. I have, uh, you, it's difficult, if I'm on an issue, it's difficult to keep me out of somebody's office. And, uh, do you threaten them with using the media or something? I do or? use the media uh -huh. when it's appropriate, uh -huh. but uh, that would not be my first uh, recourse. Uh, generally, I would go and meet with people in the appropriate uh, departments of uh, 
the federal government and then uh, through those departments would work with individuals in uh, other departments to try and bring attention to it. For example, Department of uh, Labor is very interested in this and we fought the issue on uh, grounds of uh, salary and wages and uncompensated work with no benefits. That's a clever approach. Yes. Um, can you, um, so um, let me ask you this, in summing up your life, how do you wish to be remembered? What do you see as your legacy? My legacy is really in uh, the students that I've educated. Mm -hmm. My hope is that my students uh, who have listened to me for maybe too many years now will continue uh, the kind of uh, quiet anger that I feel over the impossibility of many of these situations. And I think we've been successful with that. My wife and I have endowed a number of uh, scholarships for students to study abroad and to go abroad to look at these issues in a very personal way. And uh, we know that uh, once we get students out of the U.S. and to look at these problems in other nations that it will make a difference. Uh, it will certainly change their career paths. Well, thank you so much. You're an inspiration to us all. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the interview.